assignment is due next week. Basically what you do, click on it, and you would attach the file here. So, um, so that's that. Uh, so homework one is due next Tuesday. And you turn it in for Blackboard. So that is there. That said, I did forget one thing. And it's kind of one of those things where I'm not sure if I'm annoyed that I forgot it or I'm glad that I forgot it. And to understand why, I kind of need to tell a story. If you look, there's this nice little truck rental case here. And this truck rental case, it's, um, well, how to put it, complicated. It's very complicated. To give you an idea, I first encountered a variation of this problem when I was an MBA student, and the group I was in was the only one that got 100 for the assignment. I have since given it to undergrads and given it to grad students, and the usual rea reaction to the problem is, uh-oh. <laughs> in other words, it's difficult. If you want to see, it's a really good example of the fact that Little's Law is a law and always holds, but it can be rather difficult to follow. At any rate, so if you saw this and you printed it out, thank you. That said, we're not going, we're not going to go over it, okay? Because even when I go over it and explain to you all, the usual response is, um, okay. <laughs> In other words, it tends to be a little up here. So, homework due next week. And we don't have to worry about this. If you printed it off, thank you. That said, when we last left off, we were going over some of the methods that we have to improve a process. Specifically, we can add more people to specific tasks within the process. We can simply replicate the entire process, or we can divide the tasks more finely and divide them up among more people that way. So, we didn't get to some of the problems that I wanted us to work on last week. So that said, Let's start with the problem. If you look in your book, and I'm, an I'm annoyed that I didn't bring my book. question 4 3. What's going on is we have a process with a number of steps. And at the moment, all of those steps are taken care of by one person. As a result, first thing is find the bottleneck, find the capacity, in other words, the throughput rate, and also start by, with labor costs, it gets kind of interesting. The thing to remember is that 
You're going to be paying people whether they work or not. As a result, be sure that you take into account the time that you're paying them, but they're not working on it as well as the time that they are. That said, get to it. Part, this is a case where you will have to rearrange or more to the point reassign these tasks to each employee to help the process becomes a little slower but you'll be paying fewer people We 
to the the bottle of that one, right? So remember with the this one? So after we had the bottle, so it was five minutes. Second time it was four stops. Four stages. Four times five minutes. I think we have to see what's bad with this. Yeah, so it's only going to go as fast as the bottleneck. So if we have the bottleneck, so we need to convert that. Yep. Well, once we find, yeah, 90 seconds, we can only go to the station to the red times about that. To this process, because the whole thing, right? Because if this whole, all of this builds the toy truck, right? The, the toy. So we got to time this by nine steps. Well, yeah. Well. Yeah. I wrote it down because yeah. I saw well, the book. Well, well, cycle time for the entire process minus cycle time for that trip. Okay, yeah. So what's that? Cycle time. So you find the throughput rate for the entire process. So Put it to minutes first, right? So we got I'm just for, I just wrote down all the equations that the book says and in order to find something in one equation you can find something else so three dollars it takes one point five so we have to find how that's just the water that's just well that's how many per hour so how many trucks per hour one Thank
just no one right in. Oh, that's so good. That's yeah. Yeah. So the idle time we have to. Um,
and the throughput, the, sorry, the cycle time. <laughs> For um, station two, we've got the three. So we have a cycle time of 85. Then we have one time. One foot is like, yeah, seconds. And then do the cycle. And then if you look at the denominator, cycle time is 5 and 9. Okay. So, so we have a cycle time of 85. Yep. No, no, it didn't work for the hours. So we turn it for the hours. So we got the throughput right. And then sorry, that's the most important.
go about it, this is you want to combine some of these steps. So the question is, which steps do you combine that will have the smallest impact on your, on your overall performance? And I'm guessing you got to keep the same order, right? Oh, In this case, there, there isn't a certain time you can't go over. What we are limited to is we're limited to six orders, so we can only have six steps. As a result, we're going to need to combine three of three sets of steps. But eight is not very difficult. What's eight sixty five? Yeah, seven and eighty. We might want to try something with this fifty five. We're looking at and, and time, not as one or two. What's a good thing to do in this case is to see how much each combination would take. How long would it take to combine it? If you were to buy a lot of how long would it take to combine it? How long would it take to combine it? Uh, and then just take the three small ones. Yeah. So yeah, it's so small as four as we're saying. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Because we'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll do one and two together. Because we need to combine three steps, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, sorry. So, three steps, we need to combine three? No, no, I'm saying three total groups. So, if we do, um, if you want to get three on its own, Right off the bat, we do one and two together. One and two, we put about one, two, and four and five together. And then, one, two,
Okay. Oh, what time is it? All right, so for A, the bottleneck of the process, we got uh, station three, 90 seconds. Uh, the second question, the capacity in toy trucks per hour of the assembly line. <coughs> so we needed to um, calculate how many seconds are in an hour, and that's 3,600. seconds for how long it took. Equals 40 toys per hour. Okay. Did I clear that? Oh, I clear it. Is oh, well, that's one way to clear it. Okay. Um, the next question: What is the direct labor cost of the toy truck with the current <coughs> process if each worker receives fifteen dollars per hour expressed in dollars per toy truck? So there's nine stations. And then you have to convert that to forty trucks per hour. Um, and you get three point three seven five um, truck or dollars per truck. Um, uh, the next one, what would be the direct labor cost of the toy truck if uh, the work would be organized in a work cell that is one worker performs all tasks? Um, so we added up all of the processing times and got 665 seconds. And then 
had to convert that to trucks per hour, so 3,600 seconds over 665 equals 5.41 trucks per hour. And then it's fit, you get $15 an hour for the worker. over the five point, the five dollars and forty one cents, uh, the trucks per hour, which is equal to two point seven seven The next one here, um, the utilization of the worker in station two. Um, the cycle time is 85 seconds. And the idle time would be five seconds because of the, um, the rate of, of 90 for the bottleneck. the equation uh, of the cycle time over the cycle time and idle time, which is 85 and 5 for the 90. Um, then you get a utilization rate of 94 um, then the next question here, uh, basically you have to go through and, um, you know, divide it up and answers can vary, but we divided it up as one and uh, one, two, and three. What was it? One, two, and Right, and seven minutes to the second. Okay. And then uh, lastly, the new capacity in trucks per hour. Um, you have to find your bottleneck. Our bottleneck was the um, four, five, and six. Or the, what was it, the four and five? Eight, eight nine. nine. Oh, the eight and nine. Whoops. And it was 145 seconds. And then we had to convert that. Um, so you had the 3600 divided by the 145. And you got 24.83 trucks per hour. Okay. Got through it. Good job. <laughs> and yeah, these problems do take some time. They do also take a bit to think through. That said, it's almost seven o'clock. I see we take a break and come back at seven o five. Okay? Okay.
I normally don't watch and the reason why is whenever I watch I don't watch and, and I know that may sound superstitious and silly, but <laughs> well, it didn't work. It's something so it Yeah, if it worked, it's not silly. So I guess it is silly. Oh. And I need to. Okay, just a couple of notes. Uh, first of all, I received a request to post the answers to some of the other problems that are in the book. And so, yeah, I'll post those within the next day or so. So if you want to see what the answers are to some of the other problems and kind of how those will work, that's fine. I will be posting that within a day. So that will be available. Um, let's see. Also, don't forget, homework one is due next Tuesday. So that will be available. Uh, the lecture from last week is, oh, what's the term? It's edited, but I haven't posted the link yet. That should be up within 24 hours. And now we get to one of the one of the odder portions of this particular text. And in some ways, out a rather unique part of an operations text. To give you an idea, this was not. This particular chapter was not in the first edition. I know because I was one of the one of the I was a TA for one of the first groups that worked with this. When I saw it was in the second edition, I went, "Oh, that's fascinating." But it makes a lot of sense. Well, it can be difficult to think about what's going on, but in terms of why it's here, it, it's very important. And the reason is that these improvements in operations, these improvements in how we do business, yeah, they're nice. They're, they're pretty good. However, there is one problem. Ultimately, how we make decisions in business all go, comes back to money, right? So what are the effects of these changes in our operations on the bottom line? Now, in some cases, it's fairly obvious. But the problem just worked. You all saw what the cost of labor for each person was. You know, for each, or not for each person, but for each truck, for each toy. That has an effect on the bottom line. Sometimes with some operations it can be a little murkier as to the effect of changes in our operations on our bottom line. And unfortunately, the case that I, that I was initially going to go through would have been a situation where a company that was looking at improving itself improving its process, actually ended up losing money because of improvements that they made. So if you want to see that example, go ahead. Like I said, it's kind of complicated. But what we're going to go over for the rest of today is how operations affects the finances of an organization. So, of course, you all know what we looked at last week because you've been doing it for the last hour. So this week we're going to look at financial analysis, looking at how our operations affect the bottom line. So we're going to look at things like inventory costs. 
how much does it cost for us to put this item in inventory for a while? We're going to look at the cash conversion cycle. After all, you need money to make money. Businesses need money to make money. And ideally, the faster this cash conversion cycle works, the better off our business is. And we're also going to look at return on invested capital. We invest money in our operations. We invest money in our business. We want to know that that investment is going to pay off. So this is the why. We've been looking at how to improve processes. That said, we don't do it just to do it. You know, to quote Herman Edwards, you play to win the game. Well, this is how you win the game. You see how its effect is on your bottom line, on how well your business does. So what do we want to do? Ultimately, these parts of our process cost money. Also, these parts of our process make money, well, some of them. And what we need to do is we need to see how our process, how the design of our processes ultimately affect how much we make. Now, the strategy to which we do that, we divide and conquer. We look at these steps in the process, one part at a time, one bit of information at a time. In the same way with accounting, you look at each line, right? You see how each line affects the cash flows going in and the cash flows going out, the assets going in, the assets going out. Well, we're going to do much the same thing with our operations. So the first thing we're going to look at is inventory costs. Now, inventory is not free. Whenever we take and we buy something and we put it on a shelf, there's some costs involved in that. The first is that we took money, money that was in a bank earning interest, and we converted it to stuff. So there's a cost of capital involved there. Instead of that item making, making us money in the bank, it's sitting on a shelf, gathering dust. Insurance. After all, we don't want to lose our entire business to some catastrophe. These things happen. Devaluing. If an item sits in inventory too long, it can become worthless. It can become obsolete. Good way of thinking about this. Think about a loaf of bread sitting on a shelf. You know, at first it's nice and fluffy and fresh. And then it starts to get a little stale. Maybe after a couple of weeks, it starts to look a little green. In the same way, whatever you have on the shelf, it's going to deteriorate. It's going to spoil. It may be electronic goods. What happens to any technology over time? It gets old. It gets obsolete. These things happen. Pilferage. Good old five-finger discount, right? Stuff walks away. You may guard it with your life, but stuff still walks away. And then, if you're putting it on a shelf, that shelf has to be somewhere. You know, if you put a roof over the head, you have to pay for the roof. You have to pay for things like heating, lighting. You know, sometimes you have to rent the place. Sometimes you have to pay somebody to watch it. So all of these are costs to inventory. So if we have to pay these costs, what effect does that have per item? After all, 
That's going to have an effect on what we charge people. So, what is that effect? And this is not working. Okay. Here we go. Now, a lot of these costs are what we call variable costs. In other words, you can say per item, this is the cost. Not everything is that way, but most things you can do that with. How do we find that cost? Well, we have a couple of tools at our disposal. The first is we have this thing called inventory terms. How many of you have heard the term inventory terms? Good old accounting term, right? You see, it in, you see it in 10Ks all the time. Inventory terms is how fast, or more to the point, how often in a year. We take our entirety of inventory and replace it. So if we have this entire set of inventory, and how long would it take, how many times in a year do we get rid of it? We want inventory terms to generally be as high as possible, right? Because we don't want this stuff sitting around. So, we know a few things. We know these inventory terms. And we also know the total inventory cost per year. So what can we do? Well, we can find the inventory cost per unit by finding the annual inventory cost per unit divided by these inventory terms. Well, what's the annual inventory cost per unit? We can find that by finding how much we pay in inventory divided by the average amount. So, per item. Well, find per unit. We have, oh, sorry. So to go back, what we want is inventory cost per unit. So what we find is inventory cost per unit per year divided by inventory terms. To so find this annual inventory cost per unit we have the entire annual inventory cost, so this is big money, divided by the average amount in inventory. So, suppose we have inventory costs of a million dollars, and an average inventory of about 20,000 units. Now we have 15 inventory terms per year. Oh. We then we first find the annual inventory cost per item. So to hold an item in inventory costs $50, costs a million dollars per year divided by 20,000. So that's $50 per item per year. So to hold one item in inventory for a year would cost us 50 bucks. That said, and by the way, this kind of number, you'll be seeing this later because they are critically important when determining things like optimal order amounts. So we have inventory costs per item per year. You then divide that by our inventory turns and that gives us a dollar sign per item. In other words, 
inventory cost per item. So, to refresh, here we have inventory costs. So, I'm going to wait for that in. So, <coughs> divided by average inventory. Once we have this annual inventory cost per year, we can then divide that by our inventory terms. Yes. per year. So there is a time factor in there. So it's, you could have turns per month, turns per day, turns per year, turns per decade. So there is that per year aspect. Now, the second thing I want to go over is this thing called the cash conversion cycle. The idea here is that how a company makes money is they take that money and invest it in something. The idea, you convert cash to more cash. So what happens here? First, you have cash, you have money. So what do you do? You buy stuff. And that stuff, well, you haven't quite paid for it yet. So it becomes accounts payable. You know, it's a bill. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. At any rate, I see who gets it. Anyway, so you have a bill. And you got to pay the bills, right? And you eventually pay the bills. And this item goes into inventory. You have stuff. The goal of any business is to take that stuff and convert it back into cash. So people agree to buy your stuff. And you're billing other people. So here you sent the bills out. So you said, here, buy this. And people agree to buy it. And they say, we will pay it, pay for it at some point. And eventually, hopefully, they pay for it. At which point it's become cash again. A business wants this cycle to be as fast as possible. In particular, it wants this part of the cycle to be as fast as possible. Care to guess why? What's that? You need accounts receivable to do the other. You need that part to do the other part. Get paid so you can buy stuff. Exactly. Cash to buy At this point, you still have the cash, right? You still have the cash here. You still have the cash here. Do you have the cash here? Nope. Do you have the cash here? Nope. When you don't have cash, it's not in the bank. 
it's not earning money. So ideally, you want this part to be as fast as possible. You want to convert that inventory to sales. And you want to convert those sales to money as fast as possible. There are some companies that make an art of this, that delay the accounts payable as much as possible, and then lean on their, lean on their, their buyers, lean on their customers to get this done as fast as possible. Yeah, Walmart is very good at that at delaying payments to other people, but in making sure that people pay them. plus how long it takes to collect accounts receivable minus how long it takes to collect accounts payable. Like I said, some companies, they want this to go as fast as possible and they want to delay this as much as possible because while they have the cash, they're earning interest on the cash. Also, this is a measure of liquidity risk. Cash is liquid. You can do almost anything with it, right? Stuff is not liquid. It's much harder to convert stuff to cash than it is to convert cash to stuff. So if you can shrink this point at which cash is not yet, or that stuff is not yet cash, if you can shrink that time, this is good for your business. After all, the longer it takes your customers to pay you, the less likely it is that they will pay you. So what can we do? Well, we can do several things. First, you can negotiate for a longer accounts payable time. Here's another good old quote. I will gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today basically delaying these payments as long as you can. Then, well, reduce accounts receivable. The idea here, get the people who are a part of accounts, part of accounts receivable, get them to be more aggressive. Get them to encourage, buyer, encourage your buyers to pay as fast as possible. Also, a good thing here, Automated payments. It's beautiful, isn't it? You don't have to do any of the work and you let the computer do all of it. There is a third one, and that is reducing the time in inventory. Reducing the time that it takes to go from the stuff you just bought to when you sell it. And there are several tools that are available some of which we'll go over later. In fact, we'll go over things like just-in-time toward the end of the semester. And you know, better forecasting helps. If we know what our customers want, we know when they want it, that'll help us out. So, what can we do? If we make a change in the process, if we make it faster, if we reduce inventory, that's going to have an effect on this cash conversion cycle. So, an example. This, is, this has been fairly common in the past 10 years or so. Suppose we decide to go from a standard inventory system to a just-in-time system. Now, there are good things and there are bad things about it. The beauty of, of going to a just-in-time system well, one thing is that a lot of the variance in the process, a lot of the uncertainty in the process, you have to get rid of it just out of necessity. That's usually a good thing. However, 
it does expose you to things like supply chain risk. So there are some good and bad things to going to a just-in-time system. So in this case, we have, on average, $4 million in inventory, in pre-processed inventory, before we started working on it. We have work in process inventory of about $6 million. This is stuff that's in the process. And the annual cost of goods sold is $500 million. Now, if we do this new system, we go from $4 million in pre-processed inventory to $500,000. So what does this do to our cash conversion cycle? Well, a good way of thinking about this Before, we had 10 million in inventory. And our cost of goods sold is 500 million. So how fast are we going through this? Well, about 50 times, right? And yeah, we see 7.3 days, so that's 50 times a year. Now, if we go from 4 million to 500,000, we see that this cash conversion cycle is reduced from about, seven, from about seven and a half days to a little less than five. So we shave two and a half days off of this cycle. In other words, we go from cash to stuff back to cash all that much faster. Now this last one, this is where things really get interesting. Because determining what happens to return on invested capital, the calculations for this can be kind of strange. Here, the idea, we have return and we have invested capital. So the question is, what does this mean for business? How do we get return on our money? How do we get this money coming in? And what did we spend to get it? Now, there's a whole bunch of ways that we can look at this. We can go all the way back to throughput rate. And we can see its effect on revenue over invested capital. We can see these variable costs and these fixed costs here. So what happens if throughput rate changes? Well, it's going to change return over revenue here. But it's also going to change revenue over, over invested capital here. So the question is, what effect would a change in our throughput rate have on our return on invested capital? Well, to figure that out, kind of need to break this stuff up. Take it part by part, piece by piece. Some of these parts, well, you know them already. Things like throughput rate. Now when you do throughput rate here, it has to be the actual throughput rate. What's actually happening, as opposed to a theoretic, as opposed to a design throughput rate. After all, it's an actual throughput rate that makes you money. Fixed costs is things like labor, like overhead. You know, how much did it cost to rent this building out for a year? And then variable costs, this is the stuff that goes into what you sell. The cost of the material goods that go into each item you sell, into each product you sell. Now, that's the capital, you know, that's kind of equipment, you know things like that. Now, the result of this is that by modeling this, you can see the effect that changing anything does for the ROIC. Now, the best way to handle this, I think, is to actually walk through an example. Because this one, well, the best, one of the things you can do with this 
Excel is good at this. Excel is good for stuff like this. This is Excel is the Swiss Army knife of programs. You can use it for almost anything, right? The best thing to do here is to see what we can do with Excel. And let's start looking at that. Let's start seeing what we have here. Specifically, let's see, how about, um, you, could you open your books to page question, question, um, sorry, question 6.2. We have a restaurant here, and customers are going to order some stuff. Oh, well, it's a small restaurant, Financial District of San Francisco. The restaurant has 50 seats and is always full during the four hours of the evening. Now, it's not possible to make reservations. Most guests show up spontaneously. If there is no available seat, guests will generally move on. So. What this is telling you, it's full. We're going to be at capacity. So that's the first thing. And also, second, we have 50 seats. So we're going to be serving 50 customers at a time. So our inventory, our I, that's going to be 50. Let's start looking at some of this stuff. We ideally want for our ROIC. Return on invested capital. So let's see. Um, return. And invested capital. Let's get the invested capital part out of the way first, right? Does that sound like a good idea? There's only one part with the invested capital that I see. And that is that I see that it's about $200,000 of capital largely tied up in furniture, decoration, and equipment. So, <clears throat> capital per year is going to be Now there is one other thing I want to put in this, and there's a reason why. In this case, we want to make sure that we're using the same units, right? that whatever we're comparing, we're comparing apples to apples. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to convert this to capital per day. So let's convert it to capital per day. So we have 365, which is days per year. That's how often we work, right? At least this restaurant works. So our invested capital per day, let's put that. It's going to equal 200,000 divided by 365. So our invested capital per day is about $550, a little bit less. So what's the return? How much does this place take in per day? Well, let's start looking at the information. First, we have a capacity of 50 seats per day, or 50 seats. And let's put this over here. Let's we'll start listing information we have. How many hours per day are we open? Well, we're open four hours per day. Let's see here. We have 
guest spending 50 minutes in a restaurant. <coughs> well, if we're having four hours per day, let's put it per minute, okay? So let's change that. So 240 minutes per day. That way we're all on the same needs. And how long does a guest stay? 50 minutes. That said, there are other things that are going on, isn't there? It takes a restaurant another 10 minutes to clean the table, right? Is anyone able to be at that table at, during that 10 minutes? So let's add that. Now, the average guest, they leave $20 at the place. So revenue per guest. That's going to be $20, right? So let's put it that way. Now, we have, so those, that's the data for our guests as they come. Now, how many employees do we have at one time? Well, let's separate them out. Um, ten waiters. And ten kitchen staff. Whoops. Now, what's the wage per day? Ninety dollars. And what else do we have? We also have materials, the amount that this costs. And we see that there's different costs here. So there's the cost for the food. There's the drink cost. And in addition to this, there is a couple of other costs per day. There is a cost per, per rent, per day of rent, and there is an overhead cost per day. Give us this day our daily rent. Can you miss the material cost? Ah, uh, I thought that was the food and the drink. Is there something else? Oh, got it. So it's the two combined. Yeah. Okay. Well, I separated them out. And there's a reason why I separate these, these out. When we're making changes, and that's ideally what we're going to do, if we're going to make changes to this process, we want this as finely divided as possible. Suppose we decide that we want to have <coughs> higher quality food, but then charge higher prices. What, would, what effect would that have on our bottom line? So that's why I'm dividing as finely as possible here. So daily rent, we have $500. And we also have an overhead of $500. Now, for return per day, what the return is, is this is revenue minus cost. This is how much we make each day. 
So since return is going to be revenue minus costs, let's put those in as well. So what costs do we have? Well, first of all, let's do the revenue because that's a little easier. We first have revenue per order, right? That's just going to equal what we have here. This twenty dollars. Well, if that's our revenue per order, how many orders do we have in that? Two hundred. So how do we figure this out? Well, first we have the time per customer. which is just going to be equal to mince per guest plus the cleanup. And then we have the time in business, right? How often, how long are we open? And that's going to be this right here. Oops. So, how many customers can we serve a night? And don't forget the number of seats. So that's going to equal that. So, orders per night. Is going to equal. Well, if we're open 240 minutes. And we have 50 seats, but each customer takes up 60 minutes. So again, we can serve 200 customers a night. So this gives us our revenue. Our revenue is just going to be revenue per order times orders per night. So our revenue is going to be $4,000. So what did you do for orders per night? Orders per night is going to be the time that the restaurant is open times the number of seats. So 240 times 50. That divided by the time per customer. So what do our costs look like? Well, we can put these in several categories, right? We have labor costs. Oops. We have food costs. And then we have other. And a good way of thinking about other, other is, well, let's put other costs just to be Make sure we have it straight. Other costs, this is going to be rent and overhead. So the other cost is just going to equal our $500 rent here plus the $500 in overhead we have here. So let's see, cost is going to equal the sum of these three, labor costs, food costs, and other. So what are our labor costs here? Well, we have 10 waiters. We have 10 kitchen staff. And they're paid $90 a day. So labor costs is going to be, if you will, number of workers times times the daily wage. So this is going to equal $90. And this is going to equal the number of waiters 
and the kitchen staff. Now in this case, since we're painting them both the same thing, we don't have to worry about it. If we wanted to divide it more finely, we might want to have a separate column for the waiters and for the kitchen staff. So we could, might, you know, suppose we wanted to pay them a different amount. That happens sometimes. So our labor costs in this case are going equal to number of workers times the wage per worker. So we're paying them $1,800. And we have other costs of 1000 Hopefully our food costs aren't that much. But let's see what we have for our food costs here. First of all, we have the orders per night. Remember that? Well, we have two parts here. We have the cost per order. And then we have orders per night. Now here, for orders per night, well, that's just the same thing we got here, right? So this is just going to equal that right there. So what's the cost per order? Well, in this case, it's just going to equal this food cost plus the drink cost. So our overall food costs are going to equal the cost per order times the number of orders we have in the night. So what's our return? What's our profit each night? Well, our return is just going to be revenue minus costs. 4000 minus the 3900 here. Thus, we can get a return on invested capital. And that return on invested capital is just going to equal this return here, our daily return, divided by our daily invested capital. And we see that we have a return on invested capital of about 18%. So that's pretty good for a restaurant. Um, I am going to do one thing just to show how we can experiment with this. Specifically, I'm going to separate the workers out. And then we can experiment. We can see what this does. And let's make a little room. Okay. Uh, let's say later today. Now it's 90. So let's. And yeah, I'm going to be kind of cruel here and kind of evil, but there's three points. Number of waiters, daily wage, or staff, uh, number of kitchen staff, so in this case, this is going to equal, so let's change some things around here, and I'm making it more detailed so that we can, we have room to change things, so 10, actually, sorry, equals 10, equals that, equals kitchen staff, equals that. And then this is equal to this times that plus this times that. And there we are. So we've determ determined return on invested capital. Now the beauty of this, once we've set this up, Yes, it's a good idea to use Excel for these. Once you've set this up, you can see the effect of a change in your process on your overall 
return on invested capital. So let's see what happens. Suppose, well, suppose instead of $90, they negotiate for a raise, and get it up to 100 And this is just a kitchen staff. Well, there goes any profit you have. You have no return on invested capital. Suppose the wait staff, they want a similar increase. Suddenly, you're losing money. These things happen. These things have, these things, this does happen in real life. We see what happens when people want an increase in their wages. When that happens, well, it's going to have an effect on the business's profitability. Suppose you do the change that I was talking about before, where we have higher food costs, but we also have higher amount of revenue per guest. So the food costs, instead of 450, we decided to go a little upscale, go say $7. But we charge more. That's the beauty of it. We have a higher quality product, and hopefully charge a higher price. So in this case, we charge 25. Suddenly, we're making a lot more money, right? Our return on invested capital—it's—it's it's gone up, way up. However, suppose this increase in price has resulted in. Uh, fewer customers coming in. Say instead of 50, we only have 45 coming in. Well, that's going to have, a, have an effect as well. These changes happen all the time in a business. And by modeling in this way, we can determine what these changes will bring to our business, whether or not it brings profit or whether or not it brings loss. Okay, well, 7.55, let's take another break. Uh, how long do you want to take a break for? Five minutes? Okay, five minutes. What's that? Are you going to close this to Blackboard? I will be posting this to Blackboard, yes. In fact, a version of this is already posted to Blackboard. I just need to open it, I guess, you know, make it accessible. Oh.
do for what I what I initially intended. I realized that there is one problem, and that is, <laughs> uh, no. and that is not everybody has a computer, and that does make things a little challenging. <laughs> Okay. Well, what I'm going to do from here on in uh, how many of you have a printout of this with you? Okay, at least one per team, right? Okay, good. Because what we're going to do is we're going to try to do that just as we did before. And to do that, well, we're going to need some information. We're going to need to start cataloging this information and try to come up with what we need. So question 6-6, six, six, well, we're going to work on it in about five minutes. Because before we do that, uh, well, actually, not even five minutes. I'm going to finish lecturing, and then we're going to work on this problem. And this problem may take a bit. And then we're going to call it a night. Sound good? Okay. Now, yeah, the problem is I realize, okay, how many of you have your computers with you? A few of you but not a lot. And these problems are best solved using Excel. Because with Excel, we can make changes, we can make the adjustments as needed. At any rate, what happens with return on invested capital is, well, we first have invested capital and return, and then return, well, that's profit. So you look at revenue and costs, revenue minus costs. 
So what we can do, and what we should do, is by modeling these costs, we can see the effect that a change in the process would have on return on invested capital. We see that there's all sorts of costs that can be involved in this. Things like overhead, things like marketing, things like the labor, pro labor costs. You know, what happens if demand goes down a little bit? These are things that we have to worry about. So, by looking at these costs, it costs of labor, direct and indirect, things like variable costs, like working capital, we can distill return on invested capital to its components, to its parts, and then measure the effect of, the, of our operations on return on invested capital. So in summary, we play to win the game. We make these changes in our operations. We improve our operations for a reason, for a purpose. And that is, hopefully, to make our business more profitable. As a result, we sometimes need to measure the effect of these changes on our process. Uh, sorry, these changes in our process financially. What is the financial effect? You can look at this in several ways. One of which is inventory costs. And what is the cost per item? You can look at it in terms of the cash conversion cycle. How fast do we go from money to more money? And most importantly, what is the effect of return on invested capital? In other words, what is the effect of the money we're putting in on a profit? What is the profit we're getting from what we're spending? Okay, now, what we're going to do for the rest of this time is, you see in the examples, we have this question six cents here. And what we have is we have a limo service. They offer transportation services between the King of Prussia Mall and the center of Philadelphia. Now, there's a bunch of costs here. First, we have invested capital. So we have half of it right here. We just need to find the return on it, right? And this basically is the four luxury vans that this company owns. So each van can carry 10 passengers. Each van makes 12 trips a day. And there's a bunch of other information. So what we're going to do is, with this information, we are going to try to find return on invested capital. So let's do exactly that. So let's start. Now let's a good way of thinking about this. Let's make a nice little list of all the information we need here. Or what information do we have here? First of all, let's see. How many miles per trip do we have? 22 and a half, right? information we have here. What is the next bit of information we have? Oh, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Oh, yeah, we do make 12 trips a day from Philadelphia to KPM and 12 from KPM to Philadelphia. So let's write that down. Because it probably would be better to group it. So, So that's 12 trips a day, and we also make 12 return trips. Whoops. Okay. 
What other information do we have here? How many bands? We have we have four bands. Um, what other information do we have? Ten passengers per van. Ten dollars for a one-way ride. Now, <coughs> what other information do we have? Huh? Yep. Gas cost. And yeah, that's, um, it definitely dates this particular question, doesn't it? Let's do fuel price per gallon. What other information do we have? Our, our load factor, exactly. The current load factor is 40%. And 0.40. Any other information? What's that? 20 miles per gallon. 20 miles per gallon. Yeah, these vans get pretty good gas mileage. per year. What other information do we have? <coughs> Open 365 days. Open 365 days, exactly. And yes, never assume that it's 365 days per year. Always ask how many days per year is this place open? trips per day from KT, from Philadelphia to KPM, 12 trips per day from Philadelphia to KPM, one way or the other way. And the company charges $10 per ride, load factor is 40%, and gas mileage is 20 miles a gallon. Fuel prices are really good right now, at least compared to how they are now. Uh, staff costs, $1 million per year, and 365 days per year. So we have the information, right? So let's start doing something with it. Let's start doing a lot with it. And let's make some more room.
So we're trying to find return on invested capital, right? So there's our OIC. How do we find return on invested capital? The first thing we do is we divide it up. We have return and we have invested capital. So let's put return. And down here, let's put invested capital. Now, what is the invested capital? $800,000. Yeah, real easy, huh? Now, the, since we've done this in terms of years, because this is per year, that means everything else we do needs to be per year. Remember, compare apples to apples. Make sure you're comparing the same things. That means that we're going to need to do some unit conversion here. You need to multiply things by 365 days a year. So, what do we have for return? Our yearly return is going to be yearly revenue minus yearly cost, right? <coughs> so let's have the revenue and let's have the cost. So what's the revenue? How do we get to this? So we have trips in a year. Well, first of all, let's do days per year, which we already have. And how many trips per day do we have? 24. 24. It's going to equal e A plus B here, 12 plus 12. How much revenue per trip? Well, let's see what we have here. Revenue per trip. Well, let's see what we have. We have four. Well, we have four bands <coughs> because each van makes twelve trips, right? I believe it's twelve trips. I mean, be absolutely sure. Yeah, each van makes twelve trips. Actually, sorry, this I did forget. This should be. R2 plus R3 times the number of bands. So let's do 12 plus 12 times, whoops, times 4. That way, we have the number of trips per day. So in this case, trips per van. Well, let's separate it out actually. So it equals this plus this, and then number of bands equals that. So that this equals this times this. So if we have 96 trips per day, what's the revenue per trip? see what we have here. First of all, there's passengers per trip, right? And in this case, passengers per trip is going to equal several things. It's going to equal passengers per van, which we're going to use the 10 here. 
and then the load factor, which is how full it is. And so passengers per trip is just going to equal maximum passengers per van times the load factor here. So we have four passengers per trip. And what's the cost per passenger? $10, exactly. This equals that. Now, passenger per trip, cost per passenger, that just equals our revenue per trip. So for each trip, we're, make, we're getting revenue of $40. Costs 96 trips a day. Or we make 96 trips a day, 365 days a year. So our revenue is going to be, oh, what is our revenue going to be? Times a day, times probably times 365 days a year. Exactly. So our revenue is just going to be $40 per trip, revenue per trip, times 96 trips per day, times 365 days per year. And that gives us our revenue per year, which is what we're interested in. <coughs> so it equals 365 times 96 times $40. So we're bringing in a million four, a million four a year. Pretty good, right? Well, we still have costs to deal with. So what are the, oh yes, gasoline. We'll be paying for that. So what costs do we have? Well, the first thing we have is the staff cost, right? That's the most obvious. That's going to cost us a million dollars a year. And the other cost we have is the gasoline. So how much are we spending on gasoline? We have gas cost per year. Well, we can separate this out, can't we? After all, what's that? The oh, cost per mile and the mile. We can find the number of miles. It might be an easier way to separate it out by trip. You know, how much does one trip cost us in terms of gas? Because we already know how many trips per day we make, and by extension, we can find out how many trips per year we make. So, cost per trip. So, how do we find the gas cost per trip? 22.5 miles per trip. So we have miles per trip. Oh, we'll be using that in a minute. Miles per trip. So we have the cost per gallon. And that's going to be this two dollars and sixty-three cents. And there's one other thing we need, and that is the miles per gallon, right? What? Twenty. Exactly. So the miles per gallon is going to be right here. So a good way of thinking about this. If each trip takes 22 and a half miles, and we're getting 20 miles per gallon, how many gallons of gas are we using on this one trip? About one and an eighth, right? 
So to calculate the cost per trip, it's going to equal the cost per gallon times the miles per trip divided by the miles per gallon. And we see that cost per trip is about $2.96. So how many trips per year do we take? Well, here, we already have a lot of this information. We know the trips per day. After all, we calculated it up here. And we know the days per year. Can we just multiply these two to get the number of trips per year? Whenever I do these particular spreadsheets, I always find it useful to equal this. You know, in other words, to reference these values back. And the reason why is because what can happen is if you make a change, if you change this here within this within the spreadsheet at this point right here, does it change this? You want these changes to be consistent throughout the entire spreadsheet. And you have to be careful that you don't, that when you change it, you change it everywhere. So trips per day, it's going to be equal 96. Days per year, it's going to equal 365. And so the number of trips per year is going to equal 96 times 365. So if we make 45,040 trips a year. So from this, we can get a gas cost. It's going to equal $2.96 times 35,000. So we're spending a little over $100,000 a year on gas. This gives us a cost. And from this, this cost is just going to equal the sum of these two. It was a dark and stormy night. At any rate, oh, that was the air conditioning. It sounded like thunder. <laughs> so we have our revenue. We have our cost. We can find our return per year, our yearly return. And it's just going to equal the revenue minus the cost. And thus, we can find return on investment. <coughs> so our ROIC is just going to equal the return divided by the invested capital. And in this case, our ROIC is about 37%. So this business is doing fairly well. Return on invested capital is at a pretty good rate. We expect to make our money back in about three years. And that's, that's a good thing. It's, it works. Okay, that actually took a lot less time than I thought it would. <laughs> At any rate, um, what is what I expect for the exam in regards to this? There's some art to this, right? You saw there was some art to this. And determining what needs to go into the model, there's some art to this. For homework two, I ask you to perform one of these, to come up with one of these. I'm not going to grade that too harshly. What I want is I want a good effort. I want you to think about how to do this and how these things should come together. But I'm not going to grade it too harshly. <coughs> I want you to do it, and I want you to work on it. 
You want to come with exam time? What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a spreadsheet that you already know, a spreadsheet that we've already worked on. And I'm going to ask you something. I'm going to ask you to make changes. And based on those changes, what would be the ROIC? Okay? Okay. Like I said, it's earlier than I thought it was. That said, the breaks didn't last as long as we expected. That said, I say we call it a night. Now remember, you have homework due in a week. I'm going to post a couple things over the next day or so. And take care. on a shelf for a year, mm -hmm. it would incur 50 bucks. It would cost you 50 bucks to hold. However, it's not going to stay on the shelf for a year. It's going to stay on the shelf for maybe a week or two. And then it's going to be sold. It's going to go elsewhere. And then another book will go on the shelf. And that will spend another book on the shelf. And like so on and so on. That's the difference between the $50, which is how much it would cost to hold that item in inventory for a year and the cost that actually gets incurred by each item. The cost that actually gets incurred by each item is basically what it costs to hold it in inventory for two weeks or three weeks. So any item that is going to be paid Yes. So each item that you sell is costing $3.30 to sell within inventory for a couple of weeks. Do we need to leave another? Okay. Oh, yeah. yes. Uh, it, it would be a good idea to 